Hello and welcome to Analog Insights. In today's episode of Talking Cameras, I'm sitting down with Bellamy Hunt, who is also known as Japan Camera Hunter. Bellamy is based in Tokyo and has become one of the authorities when it comes to film cameras in the course of the last decade. He sources high quality film cameras and other photographic equipment from Japan for his clients around the world. Um, in, in this role as a buyer and broker, of course, he has established strong connections to the entire camera and film industry and has quite an insider perspective. He also started selling his own street pan film and a lot of um, accessories and merchandise in his online shop. Um, most importantly, he and his team are sharing in-depth articles, um, uh, yeah, basically with a lot of expertise in them, and also started doing videos here on YouTube on their dedicated YouTube channel. I used the opportunity to talk, um, as always, for talking cameras about, with Bellamy about his personal camera collection. I was really curious to see how somebody who's sourcing and selling so many cameras um, what he is using and settling on for his personal private use. I also use the opportunity to ask a little bit about which cameras are undervalued from his perspective and where the film industry is moving. We had our conversation on a Friday afternoon, um, his time, so early morning my time, so this is why you will see very different light situations in our Zoom um, setup. And as it's a Zoom call, of course, the quality is always a little bit limited, but we try to make the best out of it. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Um, let's get started. So hi, Bellamy. Thank you for taking the time um, to sit down with us here today. Um, as a first question, it would be great if you could um, introduce yourself to the audience. They've heard a small introduction, but of course, it's more interesting to hear it in your own words. Um, so who is Japan Camera Hunter and yeah, what exactly are you doing? Hi, Max. Well, thanks for having me on the show, first of all. I really appreciate it. Um, who is Japan Camera Hunter? Well, I, I guess, am Japan Camera Hunter, but it's so much more than just me now. Um, things have changed quite a lot. But when I initially started, I, Bellamy Hunt, um, started the business as Japan Camera Hunter, initially sourcing cameras in Japan. Um, and as the business developed, I started working with companies to supply, supply lenses, lenses and custom cameras. and. And it evolved into so much more that it's not just me anymore. I can't call just myself Japan Camera Hunter. We have a team as well now um, who, who shoulder a lot of the responsibilities too. So um, yeah, I've been in Japan 15 years and I've been doing this. I've been working as Japan Camera Hunter for 10 years now. And we just celebrated our anniversary last year, in fact. Wow, this is really impressive. So obviously, you're quite an authority in, in the field. And um, coming from that perspective, I was instantly curious um, for this format for talking cameras, um, what your personal collection looks like. And for today, you brought a couple of your personal cameras. Um, some are already known to people who know you well, others are not so much. Um, so what is the first one that you brought? So um, the first one I have, I'm going to show you, sorry, I had to move things out of the way because I have a desk full of cameras. Um, the first one is my Leica MP6. Um, and this camera is very special to me. This was my first real, uh, real serious camera that I bought for myself when I started working as you know, doing Japan Camera Hunter. And I, before I'd actually worked at Japan Camera Hunter, I had this list of cameras that I'd wanted to own. And I worked through the list until I'd had them doing the Japan Camera Hunter job. And then one day I saw this MP6 available and I thought to myself, you know, I've worked really hard. Um, this, is, this is something I want for me. Not, not to put on sale, not to flip or whatever. And I, 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 I'm denied about it for all of about 30 minutes and then you know, bought it and it's never left me since. It won't leave me, it's not going to be for sale. Um, hopefully I'll pass it on to my son if he takes to it. So it's yes, this is my MP6. 
This is an incredible camera, especially for shooting it, right? Because many people would say this is more of a collective piece. Um, I think this is a Japan only camera, right? It's limited yeah. to 250 pieces or so. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of people consider it a collector's piece. And in fact, when I bought it, I had um, several people comment to me, they're like, why are you using this thing? You know, you should just put it in a box. And I thought, what's the point in that? This is my camera. You know, why, why would I do that? You know, um, so I actually made a, comfort, uh, a conscious effort to really not babysit it at all um, and just use it as it was intended. And for, for me, me that's, 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 that's all I've ever wanted from it, really. Yeah. And this is great and then makes it even more unique. Um, looking at the 250 pieces, probably it's one of the only ones being used as much as in your case, just I, I dangling few, around your neck, right? <laughs> I know a few people who are using them who I have convinced to use them. But um, yeah, generally, it's a lot of a lot of time you see them on the market. They're in a fresh box. They've never been used. They've been handled with white gloves. Fair enough. But I'm not doing that with mine. <laughs> Sounds great. So so moving on from this camera, um, what else do you have on the table? I think there's another Leica somewhere. Um, yes. So following that up. Put that one over there safely so I don't do anything silly. Um, the next one I have is another Leica. Um, this might come as a surprise to some people, but um, because for SLRs, people commonly associate me with the Nikon F, which is one of my favorite cameras. Um, unfortunately, I don't have one because I keep on <laughs> buying them and then selling them and then thinking, oh, I can just get another one. But um, I have got this, which is Leica R8, and I've had this for a while now, and I've really taken quite a shine to it. Um, I bought it, well, I was I actually acquired it, and um, I, I didn't think I would use it that much, and we decided to make a video about it, and I ended up using it a lot, and decided, yeah, I'm going to keep this one um, until it doesn't really work anymore. Uh, bought a le another lens for it, and I've I found it a really enjoyable camera to use. The Hunchback of Soames, as it's known, um, it's bulky. It's it's not beautiful. Um, it will probably break at some point, and I won't be able to fix it. But that doesn't really matter to me. Um, to me, it's more important that I'm just enjoying myself using this camera, and it does give great results as well. So. This is what I read, like it's one of the most advanced film cameras that Leica ever created and um, at the same time it's really dividing the community because of the design. Some people even love it and others just say, okay, it's super yes. ugly. Yeah. Yes, and it came too late because it didn't have enough, you know. It was the most advanced camera Leica had ever made, but it wasn't advanced compared to the other SLRs on the market at the time for a lot less money. Yeah. And so it was a bit of a shame. It's, it's a dead end road in terms of cameras, but I love it. I, I've really enjoyed using it, even though it's unwieldy. Um, the finder is beautiful. And of course, those Leica lenses, you know, it's really sharp, lovely quality lenses. So, yeah, um, it's become a, a regular in my roster. Um, and, and coming to more advanced SLRs, or at least the company that is also known for creating um, more advanced SLRs at the time, and that would be Minolta. And here we, we, we share a story that uh, our dad's cameras, so to speak, are Minolta's. And, um, really? Your dad's camera was a Minolta too? An, an XT7. And this is what, oh, what okay. got me started and what basically all my childhood images were taken within, with an XT7. And now I'm curious to see what, what you brought. That's fantastic because, um, you know, I, I have a friend, my, well, my assistant, his also, his first camera is his dad's cam. He's got a Minolta as well. That's pretty cool. I have not the best, not the fanciest. It's just the standard Minolta XG1. Um, but this was the camera that my dad used and um, I relieved him of it at the age of about 14 <laughs> and and just started shooting like crazy with it i fell in love with it uh, the way you could you know the slr system where you could change lenses and mess around with filters and i it, it started me on my photography journey um it still works not fully the lighter meter doesn't work anymore can't have that repaired 
um, but it's still working and it's still taking pictures and I still put rolls of film through it fairly regularly. Um, it to me it's I mean monetarily it's worthless effectively you know but to me this is probably the the most valuable camera I own um, just because of the connection uh, to my father and and to where I sort of came from in my photography journey it, it really means a great deal to me so and I've had my son shoot this as well so it's oh. gone on to the third generation which yeah. is great no, that's amazing and and right you're using it with the original strap um, yes it, the original it, strap yeah um, you'll uh, I offer my apologies it's gross because I haven't washed it because I absolutely refuse to <laughs> yeah which I understand and it's also it's the nice logo right the rising sun logo at yeah, the front the and all that. it's brilliant it's, yeah. it really is um, I mean it's an XG1 it's not a great camera it's it's really basic but I don't care it, it works for me and I've got some great pictures out of it so yeah Moving on to the next camera, you also have something in the lineup that is not that surprising, um, something yeah. from Nikon. <laughs> yes, yes, I do have another Nikon. Um, and uh, well, some people might be surprised because I think a lot of people associate me with the FM3A. Um, and this actually isn't an FM3A at all. This is uh, an FE2. Um, which really isn't that special, actually. Um, it's a fairly, I mean, the FM2 is probably a better camera. But again, this this is another important camera to me because this was gifted to me by my father-in-law. Um, and he found it in his cupboard and said, when we only really first just met, and he said, oh, I thought you might like this. And he pulled it out of the cupboard and he gave it to me. And I it worked and I was like wow fantastic thank you so much um, and I've had it uh, refurbished since and I uh, I've put a Nikon lens on it I put a Nikon uh, 45 AIP which is the one which is for the FM3A exactly. um, yeah and but I really like that lens a lot of people don't um, but I do and so that lens sits uh, permanently on this camera um, and yeah, it, it, I love the way it works. It's again, it's an heirloom camera. It's not the best, but I've taken some great pictures of it. I've taken some very personal pictures, family and things. So it has a, an important meaning to me. And I think you can probably see a common sort of thread through there, through the collection so far. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and and regarding that lens, um, because you mentioned many people don't like it, when I when I mentioned to Jules um, that you have that lens, I got these drooling emojis back. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is like a yeah. Some I, people like it, and others are just very indifferent towards it. Um, some people consider it to be quite flat. Um, I found quite the opposite in some cases. Uh, it takes a bit of getting used to, perhaps, maybe. But I've always enjoyed shooting it, so it, it's just lived on this camera. Uh, I don't think it's ever come off. Okay, great. Despite the fact that it is really designed for the FM3A, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and this is the thing. Um, I will eventually have an, uh, an FM3A. I think it's an outstanding camera. Um, I've, I've owned many, many of them, mm. and they pass through, through the, the doors. doors. And every time I think, yeah, I should keep one of these, and then it goes, and... Sooner or later, I'm going to just keep one. And, you know, because this, the FE2, this won't last forever and it's very difficult to repair now. So eventually this will sort of be put into the uh, into the cabinet and an FM3A will take over the duties on that one. Yeah. And speaking of patterns, what I found interesting is that it seems like since it's your job to buy and sell cameras, you need to have these really strong personal connections to have a good reason to hold on to a camera. Otherwise, it's yeah, there's always a, a, a buyer out there, right? Yes, uh, and I found that very quickly because you can't keep every camera that you want. Um, so when I started, I was very excited and I wanted to keep everything and I couldn't do that. And I quickly became aware of what I wanted from a camera more than just monetary value or, or I needed a real connection to keep something. Um, and, and that's sort of become quite important for me now. I think I, I do have collectible cameras, but 
they are they're just more investment than anything mm -hmm. um the, it, these ones would never probably be for sale i don't think uh, i think if i if anything i'd probably just you know give them to a friend or family members you know um to me that's more important yeah and speaking of personal connections the next camera actually carries your name right it's a <laughs> It has some kind yeah, of Bellamy in there. Version of my name, it does. Yeah, this one is um, this one is an awful camera. Um, uh, <laughs> it really is. This is the Chin On Bellamy. Um, it it it's nothing special. In fact, it's pretty awful. <laughs> but it's got my name on it. Um, not the exact spelling, but it has my name on it. And the funny story is with this camera. I was working um, for a, a photography store in Tokyo and I had just left the company and I just set up Japan Camera Hunter on my own and I was going to a camera fair and they had a stall at the camera fair and my ex-manager, I guess you could call him, beckoned me over and he said, I've got something very special to show you. You'll love it. And he makes a big fuss out of pulling this box from underneath the table and he pulls out this and he just starts laughing. <laughs> and he goes, I found your camera. <laughs> and I said, brilliant, right, I'll take it. How much is it? And he said, oh, it's 8,000 yen, but for you, 12,000. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, thanks very much. Um, and he, he was joking, he gave it to me for a really nice price. But um, yeah, it, it, it's not a great camera. It's, it's it, in fact, it's pretty awful, but it doesn't matter. It's fun. I've had a lot of fun playing with it. I've taken it out plenty of times. The lens is a bit foggy. The find is a bit foggy. The flash doesn't work. Who cares? It, how many people can say they have a camera with their name on it? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a super <laughs> cool story. Yeah. Especially that. Yeah. How yeah. he presented it to you, it sounds like, okay, this is like a unique Leica piece or whatever he found. And yeah. it's just yeah. this. Yeah. He had me going. He really did, yeah. Yeah. So moving on to the last camera, um, yeah. this one is a really weird and odd one, I would say. Yes. This is, um, again, people associate me with high-end premium compact cameras. And yes, I do sell them. And yes, I see a lot of them. But I personally don't shoot them, not anymore. Um, they've become, I think, again, too expensive, perhaps, and too fragile. And this camera is not fragile at all. This is the Konica Gemba Kantoku. Um, and this is a construction camera. It was built for a uh, construction foreman to take red measurements and records and photographic records of building sites and work sites. So it's waterproof, drop proof, sand proof, dust proof. I actually initially bought uh, a few of them. I bought one for myself and one for my son because my son at the time was five, I think. And I wanted a camera that was pretty indestructible. That's perfect. Yeah. And this was it because he could drop it, he could get it wet and it didn't matter. And he loved it. He had a great time with it. And I bought one for myself at the same time and I ended up really loving it. So I buy more and I bought one for uh, my assistant, I, my designer, I bought one for him. And now this camera actually isn't, it is mine, but it's been kind of pinched by uh, one of my staff who's just said, yeah, I'm having this, it's great. <laughs> um, so I'm probably gonna have to prize it back from him at some point, but, um, I like it because it's got a great lens. It's got this fantastic 28 millimeter lens on it. And yet you don't have to baby it. You don't have to worry about it. You can just, I mean, I can sling it over my shoulder while I'm riding my bike and not care. Yeah. You know, uh, that's, that's good for me. That works for me. And, and yet I was wondering, are they difficult to find? Because my understanding no, is no. you, you had to be in a certain role to get them. You couldn't purchase them just like that. Uh, yeah, so from, from what it is stated that they were only given out to companies and businesses and, you know, workmen. It wasn't sold to the general public, it was sold to workmen. But there's lots and lots and lots of them here. Cool. Uh, it's pretty easy to get one, in actual fact. And they the bonus is that they're still really inexpensive. 
you know um you, you don't have to pay a lot of money for one and and that's a good thing because you know if you spend a hundred dollars on one of these you don't really mind when it finally says yeah i don't want to do this anymore mm. and you just think okay fair enough i'll go and find another one <laughs> great um, so moving away from the, the cameras, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you just recently had your 10th anniversary. And um, I want to use the opportunity to also talk a little bit about the film industry and how it has changed from your perspective in the last decade since you were doing that. And you've mentioned it before, you've been in the industry even earlier. And uh, I'm super curious to get your opinion on all the hype cycles that we're seeing and also what, what your perspective is, how the industry has changed. Yeah, it's changed a huge amount from when I first started doing this. I mean, I used to go out to the stores and just buy a thousand, two thousand dollars of film, and that was a lot of film. That was bags and bags that I physically could not carry myself. You know, I'd have to have them sent to me because it was so much film. And yeah, you, you a couple of thousand dollars now, and you've got what two rolls of Provia. <laughs> <laughs> a box of portrait or something um yeah there's been a, a huge change um the availability um the prices have have gone up obviously the popularity of film has gone up which is great but there has been a uh, cause and effect and there is a bottleneck in the film production system that's at the moment people are experiencing a lot of uh shortages of color film and there's a reason for it there's a huge demand there's COVID, obviously, and a lot of disruption in Europe from what's going on in Ukraine. Um, so this has had a, a huge impact, but you've also seen consolidation of some of the larger companies um, so that they can make their business a, perhaps a bit more streamlined, um, work better. You're going to see in the future, I think, a lot more uh, I think there's going to be more ranges of film coming. I think there's going to be... What's happened is um, people have sort of really got into film cameras, but the film camera industry hasn't moved, or the film industry hasn't moved quickly enough to anticipate that. Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing this shortage and this, this backlog as people have got into it. And so now they're starting to, you know, ramp up. And so that will change in the future. Uh, I think there's going to be greater availability. There's also going to be greater uh, focus on home uh, solutions for for film developing and for film scanning and perhaps even for film cameras. Um, people are, uh, are making use of modern technologies, so like 3D printing and so on. And that's been a huge change in the 10 years since I've been doing this because nobody was talking about releasing new films when I first started this and now there's several companies releasing new films, myself included. So, yeah. yeah. And not just releasing new film, but slowly we also see new cameras like the, the yes. Kodak half frame camera that is all the yeah. rage right now, but, but also yeah. what is your perspective on that? Do you see the, the big players reintroducing certain no. film cameras or maybe taking the knowledge that they have today to make the ultimate film cameras? I mean, I would like to say yes, but I don't think that would happen. I even implored Nikon recently in an article when I wrote about the, the death of the SLR line that, to say, why don't you create a, a, a micro artisan studio that makes, you know, uh, special handmade Nikon F recreations? They would sell, I mean, of of course they would be expensive but they would sell and they would drive market demand for perhaps lesser uh expensive cameras or cheaper cameras uh, but as i say you know you're going to see a lot of ingenu ingenious people um using utilizing modern technology and micro technology um to make cameras in the future i think that's where we're going to see the next film cameras come from it's not going to come from one of the big brands um their industry right now is risky, to say the least. I don't think that they really have uh, 
I don't think they can afford to take that sort of risk. You know, you see Leica and they are focusing on a very specific market, which is extremely rich people when they release a $20,000 special edition because they know they can sell it. But they're less sure about selling a $4,000 regular camera. So, um, yeah, I think the future is homebrew um, or, or even new companies. Perhaps even, I, I think maybe as we saw with Yashica, but Yashica was a real sort of mess. Mm. Um, perhaps one of these old company names, Agfa or something, will get bought and be used and actually make a proper camera and uh, put a proper camera with a good name on it. That'd be something I'd very much like to see. Yeah, same here. That would be super interesting. Yeah. And, and coming back to the 10th anniversary and your own business, um, if you look, you mentioned your team briefly. What has changed um, for your own business in that time? <laughs> What has changed? I mean, when I started JCH, I started it from my living room in, uh, in a tiny apartment in outside, just outside of Tokyo. And I was running around all day, running to stores, just buying whatever I could find, whatever I'd hoped would sell, run, trying to put together a website with very little knowledge of how to do that. Um, but I knew what I wanted to do. And so I pushed really hard. I had a better website made. I, I started working on you know my own products, like the film cases and things like this. And... Within the space of two years, I'd gone from that to a bigger home office to the point where I'd, okay, I need a separate office now. I can't, I can't do this from home anymore. It's infringing on my life, you know? Mm. Um, and <clears throat> so um, I think around the period of about three years in, I, I got a smaller off, a small office near to um, my home and Again, it kept on growing. We, we released the film, we released more film cases, more products. We started working on custom things to the point that now I'm in um, a, a much larger office space. I have uh, two full-time staff and part, two part-time staff. Um, I have a designer, a marketer, um, you know, admin. So yeah, a lot has changed. It's I never expected it to become this, and I'm overjoyed that people have supported me enough that it has become this. And, and if I may ask that on a personal level, because it sounds like you turned into a businessman, and it takes a lot to create such a business, right? In terms of understanding of okay, how to hire people, how to do all the stuff that's involved with that, and that's sometimes keeping people from growing to that extent and, and just say, okay, I just remain at a certain level because that's yeah. what I can handle. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I know what you mean because I did feel that like that for a period and I didn't want to. Um, and when I was in the previous office, I thought I can just do this myself and stay this sort of size and that would be fine with me. Um, and, and then um, my accountant actually said to me, yeah, the government kind of won't let you do that. You know, um, Interesting. you know, you kind of, if you want to, you know, we, you know, uh, build the business or if you want to continue doing business, you have to basically be growing really. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise your tax burden becomes extremely high. So it was encouraged. I was encouraged by them, you know, please try to expand, please try to get bigger. It's actually better for you if you do so. Okay, and, great. Yeah. Um, so, um, but also I realized after a, a period, you know, perhaps I don't want to just stagnate, that you need to keep on evolving and adapting. And I was watching how other people were set, starting to sell and how other businesses were starting to appear. And I realized, yeah, you adapt to survive. And so when Corona came around, I, I was mentally prepared for that adaptation. Uh, and I think had I'd only been in business for a couple of years at that point, I would have sunk. Mm. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, now I have to ask you that it's um, something that you that's a little bit rude because I'm tapping into your expertise here. <laughs> um, but I'm really curious about that. Um, 
I personally feel like a lot of cameras have been hyped um, in recent years, like significantly to the extent that where even I can say, um, looking back maybe six years or five years, certain cameras also that I bought had yeah. expensive but still reasonable prices back then. And yeah. I have some cameras in my collection that doubled in their prices or even more. Yes. And I feel like I would not be able or willing to purchase them today. And at the same time, I feel like there are very few hidden gems left. And my core question is, are there any cameras or lines of cameras where you feel they are undervalued? Or has everything um, been discovered by now? Well, that's the catch-22, isn't it? Because yeah. I'm partially yeah. responsible for making some of these cameras hyped and, and, you know, through increasing awareness of them and therefore people want them more and supply and demand so the prices go up. And so every time I post something on Instagram or something on YouTube, people go, oh, great, thanks a bunch. Now, now we, we can't, can't afford, afford these. these. Same here. <laughs> it happens to <laughs> me as well. Yeah. If I start telling you a list of cameras, you know, people are going to be furious with me. But um, uh, I still think Nikon uh, SLRs. I still think Nikon SLRs, F, F2s, F3s, uh, they are, you know, accessible. They are relatively still inexpensive. Um, the prices have remained fairly steady. And, and you get a lot of camera for your money, an awful lot of camera for your money. And I think you would be better off spending three four hundred bucks or, or more on one of those than than chucking some money into a, a a compact camera that might perhaps not work so um or might die after a year so i i yeah i'd like to say nikon are still underrated in many ways mm. and anything um, else that you can think of yeah <laughs> uh, well, the Konica Gemba Kantoku, yeah, that's cheap and cheerful. <laughs> um, yeah, it, the problem is uh, there is still a lot of cameras that are unrecognized, but they are hard to repair or impossible to repair in many cases, which makes them perhaps less valuable. I, I don't want to recommend somebody goes out and buys something and then it breaks on them immediately. But um, Olympus XA. Olympus XA, XA2s, they're still cheap. They are brilliant. They're pretty much easy to, they, well, they are easy to use. It's pretty easy to repair for the most part. So, yeah, again, um, I don't know about pricing. I think the prices have probably gone up a bit mm -hmm. on those now. It's, it's the same for everything. You see some stores charging silly money for even cameras you've never even heard of before. Yeah. Um, it's a case of just having your wits about you, and um, if you see something that's that's that you want, get it now because it's only going to go up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time. I really, really enjoyed our conversation and really appreciate it that you bring some of your expertise um, in here um, and share it with us. Um, of course, we're linking to all the videos that you did um, on the cameras that were mentioned, and um, yeah. Thanks for the conversation and uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday and talk to you soon. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Cameras with Bellamy Hunt and a glance at his personal camera collection. If you did, please remember to like this video and maybe even share it with your friends. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Um, Jules, Greg and I really appreciate each and every subscriber coming our way. So thanks for watching. I hope to see you soon. Bye.